How to conquer evil with the good. All of us are affected by evil in some way. Evil is anything that results in pain, sorrow or distress. Now, many experience evil in the form of poor health, accidents, natural disasters, disappointments, injustices, losses of various kinds, hurtful talk and thoughtless actions of others. And it can result in immense suffering physically and emotionally. But when we experience evil, the human tendency is to become resentful or blame others, even God sometimes. Now, some retaliate seeking vengeance, often making matters worse. However, the Bible shows that it is possible to conquer evil with good. Let's have a look at Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 21. Do not let yourself be conquered by the evil, but keep conquering the evil with the good. Now, before learning how we can do so, we will discuss how evil came about in the first place. So what was the origin of evil? Well, after creating the first human pair, God saw everything that he had made and look, it was very good. So says Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 there. But everything was designed to bring eternal good to mankind. Now, the tree of knowledge of good and bad reminded Adam and Eve of God's right to determine standards of conduct. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. So that's Genesis chapter 2, verses 16. And 17. Jehovah God also gave this command to the man From every tree of the garden you may eat to satisfaction. But as for the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat from it, for in the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, if they were obedient, no harm or evil would come to them or their offspring. However, as you probably know already, the devil deceived Eve, and then both Adam and his wife disobeyed Jehovah by eating that fruit from that forbidden tree. So thus they allowed themselves to be conquered by evil, didn't they? Now, as a result, their descendants were left with a legacy of sin and death. Now, let's see what the Bible tells us about that, again in Romans chapter 5. So that's Romans chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 12. That is why, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because they had all sinned. Of course, Satan was not directly responsible for every incident of evil that befalls mankind. But time and unforeseen occurrence, or imperfection and poor judgment, can bring evil results, as it were. Now let's have a look at some scriptures here, at uh, Psalm 51, verse 5, to begin with. So at Psalm 51, verse 5. Look, I was born guilty of error, and my mother conceived me in sin. So that's one reason why we experience evil. Now let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 27. Just a few uh, pages on there. So that's Proverbs chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 27. The one who diligently seeks to do good seeks favour, but the one searching for bad, that is what will surely come upon him. So there we see that imperfection can um, also bring evil upon us. Now let's have a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10. So again a few pages onwards to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. 9 verse 11. 
What does this tell us? I have seen something further under the sun, that the swift do not always win the race, nor do the mighty win the battle, nor do the wise always have the food, and nor do the intelligent always have the riches, nor do those with knowledge always have success, because time and unexpected events overtake them all. Now, nevertheless, Satan's influence is clearly one of the reasons why wickedness prevails today as never before. Many are without love of goodness, as the Bible says, proof that we are living in the last days. Now you see that, don't you, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now, the great tribulation is thus imminent. God will intervene to remove wickedness from the earth by destroying the wicked. So is not the destruction of wicked ones an act of evil on God's part, you might ask? Well, yes, but in the Bible, evil is not always synonymous with what is bad. In the Hebrew scriptures, the word rendered evil can also mean calamitous, gloomy and ugly. At times, Jehovah has rightfully brought evil or calamity upon disobedient humans. Now, let's have a look at uh, an example here in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. So that's Genesis chapter 8. And we'll consider together verse 21 there. And Jehovah began to smell a pleasing aroma. So Jehovah said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground on man's account, for the inclination of the heart of man is bad from his youth up, and never again will I strike down every living thing as I have done. So he said that um, after the flood there, didn't he? Now let's have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 22. So that's Deuteronomy. And we're going to look at verse, sorry, chapter 6, verse 22 there. What does that tell us? So before our eyes, Jehovah kept sending signs and miracles, great and devastating upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household. So that was when uh, Jehovah acted against Pharaoh and his uh, obstinate uh, personality there. Now, far from being morally bad, the Great Tribulation will clear the way for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is to dwell. Now that is what uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 7 and 13 tell us. Shall we have a look at those scriptures there? So 2 Peter chapter 3, just before Revelation there, and we're going to look at verses 7 to begin with and 13. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are reserved for fire and are being kept until the day of judgment and of destruction of ungodly people. Verse 13. But there are new heavens and a new earth that, are we, that we are awaiting according to his promise. And in these, righteousness is to dwell. So conquering evil with the good then. In the meantime, we must cope with much evil. Evil things such as crime or accidents can often be anticipated and avoided, or at least to be made less serious, by careful forethought. Now let's have a look at uh, a scriptural principle here in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. So that's Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. The shrewd one sees the danger and conceals himself, but the inexperienced keep right on going and suffer the consequences. Often, though, we cannot avoid evil, and we must try to conquer evil with good. It does not necessarily mean passively enduring mistreatment. Now, goodness is a positive quality but expresses itself in beneficial acts. 
So let us now examine specific situations in which we can conquer evil with good. Now, for example, persecution is often something that we need to endure. Now let's have a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. So that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, all those desiring to live with godly dev devotion in association with Christ Jesus will also be persecuted. So it's something that uh, all of us are going to have to face at some time or another. So how do we conquer it? Well, we conquer by refusing to compromise and by enduring with joy for the sake of a good news. Shall we have a look at a scripture here in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 29. So Acts, Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 29. Now you're probably familiar with these verses, but um, this is very, very apt for this particular subject. So they brought them and stood them before the Sanhedrin, when the high priest questioned them and said, We strictly ordered you not to keep teaching on the basis of this name, and yet look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring the blood on this man upon us. In answer, Peter and the other apostles said, now his, this is how they reacted, we must obey God as ruler rather than men. So in other words, they refused to compromise. Now let's just uh, move on a few verses to 40, and 40, 40 to 42 there. It says, as this they took his advice and they summoned the apostles, flogged them and ordered them to stop speaking on the basis of Jesus' name and let them go. So they went out from before the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to be dishonoured in behalf of his name. So that's where the joy comes into it there, that they had succeeded. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued without let up, teaching and declaring the good news about the Christ Jesus. So that's a very, very clear example there on how to deal with persecution, of which we will all face at some point in time. Now, by doing good or exercising kindness, we may even soften persecutors. Turn so would be pleased to Matthew chapter 5. So that's Matthew chapter 5, and we'll look at verse 44 there. However, I say to you, continue to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. So that, again, is another instruction on how to deal with such things. Now, just as another scripture there, let's have a look at Romans chapter 12. So that's Romans chapter 12. I'm going to look at verses 17 to 21 there. Return evil for evil to no one. Take into consideration what is fine from the viewpoint of all men. If possible, as far as it depends upon you, be peaceable with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but yield place to the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Jehovah. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you heap fiery coals in his head. Do not let yourself be conquered by the evil, but keep conquering the evil with the good. So heaping fiery coals on somebody's head is not actually as uh, severe as it sounds it is actually doing a refining as it were so effectively by your graciousness in the face of provocation you may soften even the hardest of attitudes and bring out the good in people by showing understanding empathy, even compassion for the offender. You might be able to help him to learn Bible truths. 
Now, whatever the case, a mild response gives the individual an opportunity to reflect on your fine conduct. Now, another evil that so we all have to face at one time or another is death of a loved one. And at such a time, strong, confusing emotions can arise following the death of a loved one, can't they? Now, grieving is normal, and it's even beneficial, believe it or not. Let's have a look at John chapter 11, verses 33 to 35. Now, you're probably familiar with this account, and it's when um, Jesus resurrects Lazarus, doesn't he? Now, let's have a look at uh, John chapter 11. And we're going to consider verses uh, 33 to 35 together. What does that tell us? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he groaned within himself and became troubled. So we see there that uh, Jesus um, became troubled there, didn't he, with the death of Lazarus. Now he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus gave way to tears. At that, the Jews began to say, see what affection he had for him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of a blind man prevent this one from dying? Then Jesus, after groaning again within himself, came to the tomb. It was in fact a cave and a stone was lying against it. However, prolonged grief can be damaging and it can lead to serious depression. Now, we can gradually conquer overwhelmingly negative emotions by applying practical scriptural advice. We need complete trust in God and the hope in his sure promises that can also help ones recover. By doing good for others, we avoid isolating ourselves and we taste the joy that comes from giving. Let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. Whoever isolates himself pursues his own selfish desires. He rejects all practical wisdom. Now, let's just turn over there to Acts 20 and verse 35. This is a scripture that's quite familiar to a lot, but let's have a look at Acts 20, verse 35. And we see what, uh, what's said about uh, kindness here. What does it tell us? I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, you must assist those who are weak and must keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus when he himself said, there is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. And how true that is at times. Now, what about the situation when others offend us? Thoughtless words or actions of others can hurt, and it can hurt deep. Now, let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Proverbs 12, verse 18. Thoughtless speech is like the stabs of a sword, but the tongue of a wise is a healing. So we can conquer bad feelings toward others by forgiving outright or by settling differences quickly and in a spirit of love. Let's just have a look at the scriptural um, advice we get here in Ephesians chapter 4. So that's Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll look at verses 26 and then 32. Be wrathful, but do not sin. Do not let the sun set while you are still angry. 
32, but become kind to one another, tenderly compassionate, freely forgiving one another, just as God also by Christ freely forgave you. So that last verse there really puts it into perspective, doesn't it? It says there that freely forgive one another, just as God also by Christ freely forgave you. So if we want to be forgiven ourselves, we need to forgive those who offend us. But of course, it's not an easy thing to do, is it? But we, we must do that anyway. We must try our very best to do so. Now, let's have a look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14. Accordingly, as God's chosen ones, holy and loved, clothe yourselves with tender affections of compassion, kindness, humility, mildness and patience. And here's a point here. Continue putting up with one another and forgiving one another freely, even if anyone has a cause for complaint against another. Just as Jehovah freely forgave you, here we go again, you must also do the same. So that's a very important point, isn't it? It's reiterated uh, a number of times in the Bible there. Now, conquering evil with a good can also include making changes in our own personality so as not to harm ourselves or others. So what about hurtful speech and attitudes? Anger, hatred, slander and lying disturb peace and unity in the congregation. There's no two ways about that. But by continuing to progress in putting on a new personality, one can conquer hurtful speech and attitudes with wholesome thinking and speech. Are you still in Colossians chapter 3 there? If you are, let's have a look at verses 8 to 10. Colossians 8, so chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. But now you must put them all away from you, wrath, anger, badness, abusive speech and obscene talk out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Strip off the old personality with its practices and clothe yourselves with the new personality which through accurate knowledge is being made new according to the image of a one who created it. So that is what we need to do, isn't it? Now, what about the misuse of alcohol? Well, a moderate use of alcohol can pose both physical and moral dangers, and it can even be fatal. Now, let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 20 and 21. Proverbs chapter 23, and we're looking at verses 20 and 21. Do not be among those who drink too much wine, among those who guard themselves on meat. For a drunkard and a glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. Now let's just move on there to 29. It tells us, Who has woe? Who has uneasiness? Who has quarrels? Who has complaints? Who has wounds for no reason? Who has bleary eyes? Those lingering along over wine, those searching out mixed wine. Do not look at the wine's red colour as it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. So we see there already, don't we, that um, wine can be a bit of a, a danger. Now let's have a look at, uh, let's just so we read on there to uh, 35. It says, for in the end, it bites like a serpent and it secretes poison like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will speak perverse things. And you will uh, be like one lying down in the middle of a sea, like one lying at the top of a ship's mast. You will say, they have struck me, but I did not feel it. They beat me, but I did not know it. When will I wake up? I need another drink. So, Again, we see the seriousness of drinking too much alcohol there, don't we?
So how could we conquer? Well, we'd conquer by drinking alcohol in moderation or even by abstinence. Now, moderate drinking is possible for many who rely on Jehovah and exercise self-control. Now, those who have developed a serious dependency upon alcohol need to put forth strenuous efforts to break free of addiction. Now, what about bad associations? Well, our emotions and conduct are greatly affected by those we choose as associates. Choosing to mingle with those who are not servants of God can only bring calamity. Now, let's have a look at Genesis chapter 34, verses 1 to 3. So that's Genesis chapter 34, verses 1 to 3. Now Dinah, Jacob's daughter by Leah, used to go out to spend time with the young women of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamar, the, the Hivite, a chieftain of the land, saw her, he took her and lay down with her and violated her. And he became very attached to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he fell in love with a young woman and spoke persuasively to her. So we see there that Dinah had bad association with uh, Shechem there, who uh, eventually violated her. Now, we need to conquer by selecting upbuilding associates within the congregation. Those who are uh, applying Jehovah's standards. But what about the love of money? Well, that's very prevalent these days, isn't it, in, the, uh, in this day and age? Now, the love of money can cause one to forget Bible principles. Let's have a look at Proverbs 28, verse 20. Proverbs 28, and we're looking at verse 20. A faithful man will receive many blessings, but the one hastening to get rich will not remain innocent. What did Paul say to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6? Shall we have a look? It's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're looking at uh, verses 9 and 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're looking at verses 9 and 10. But those who are determined to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge men into destruction and ruin. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of injurious things, and by reaching out for this love, some have been led astray from the faith and have stabbed themselves all over with many pains. So it could lead one to adopt a dishonest business practice or even exploit a relationship with brothers for financial gain. Christians, on the other hand, need to conquer such evils by fulfilling obligations and avoiding sharp practices. Let's just return to Proverbs and we'll look at uh, chapter 21 there. And we'll look at verse 6 of Proverbs 21. Gaining treasures by a lying tongue is like a vanishing mist, a deadly snare. So it's something we certainly want to avoid, isn't it? Now, we can conquer as well by being content with life's necessities. In fact, this is an instruction really that, Matthew, uh, that uh, Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and 34. Shall we have a look? So that's Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Keep on then seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things, these are the necessities in life, will be added to you. So never be anxious about the next day, for the next day will have its own anxieties. Each day has enough of its own troubles. So what are the rewards of conquering evil with good? Well, it brings greater happiness and contentment in life now. We can have satisfaction 
of knowing that we did the right thing and are pleasing to God. Let's just uh, have a look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. So that's 1 Peter chapter 3, once again. And we're going to look at verses 10 to 17. For whoever would love life and see good days must guard his tongue from bad and his lips from speaking deception. Let him turn away from what is bad and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of Jehovah are on the righteous and his ears listen to their supplication. But the face of Jehovah is against those doing bad things. Indeed, who will harm you if not if you become zealous for what is good? Very good question, that isn't it? Now, um, let's, it goes on to say there. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are happy. However, do not fear what they fear, nor be disturbed, but sanctify the, the Christ as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defence before everyone who demands of you a reason for the hope you have but doing so with a mild temper and deep respect. Maintain a good conscience so that in whatever way you are, are spoken against, those who speak against you may be put to shame because of your good conduct as followers of Christ. For it is better to suffer because you are doing good, if it is God's will to allow it, than because you are doing evil. So they were very winsome words there, weren't they, um, coming from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 there. So by conquering evil with good, we glorify God as a result. Now, evildoers may be moved by our upright example and follow suit. Example is always a good teacher, isn't it? Now, ultimately, those who conquer evil with good will be rewarded with everlasting life and happiness. Let's look at our last final scripture here in Psalm 37, verse 27. Is that Psalm 37, verse 27? Turn away from bad and do what is good, and you will remain forever. So I'll leave you now with this question. Are you conquering evil? with the good. If you would like a free home Bible study at a time and place to suit you, please navigate your browser to jw.org and follow the links online. Thank you for listening.